Fair number one, I grew up around here. Story I have to tell you that when you come talk about food, right? I had a friend of mine, a Greek friend of mine, and I used to go and see, his, see him and see his mum. And his mum used to always want to cook me all these Greek food because she thought I was too skinny. <laughs> and every time I go there, she wants to feed me. And I said to her, no, no, it's too much. You know, come on, you're too skinny. <laughs> uh, things like that. So Greek food I had that as well. See? And I had Indian food. Because as you said, we live in a place where it's all different race of people. So I try different things. And I get to know different people. Because I know a lot of different people by teaching fitness. Greek, Chinese, Indian, Turkish, everybody. So all these people come here. Obertüre in der Pfade zum Park, zu Pfaden durch den Park werden. Wir berücksichtigen unsere neuen Heime und lernen uns zu unterhalten. Okay, I said to my father, where is it? can I go and play? And he said to me, there's a park over the road. So I came over here and I saw this park. I've been coming here ever since. Geese, domesticated geese, because they had names, there were six. And there was uh, one there who was uh, all white with deep blue eyes and we called him Frankie for obvious reasons <laughs> of uh, old blue eyes himself. Well, Finsbury Park, as I say, I was only three when I moved there. Uh, I was only with my father. My mother was ill. She was ill with TB. So my father looked after me by himself and he used to take me to Finsbury Park. Uh, it would be difficult to say what. I know I used the playground and I know I loved the swing, but whether the falling off the swing and seeing stars was at Finsbury Park or Woodbury Down Estate, I can't be too sure. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been so cold in my life. <laughs> you know, when I first came, we came to Heathrow Airport, and I think it was in, in April, and I like, I've never been. Fin been cold since like this because I had to when I when I got off the plane I had to touch to see if my ears and my was still there you know still attached you know it's incredible I've never been so cold but, uh, then we had uh, Snowy which was another white one I called him Snowy uh, as I brought the names in for the big keys so the ducks had, had got names and everything else uh, well I suppose you could say youth, stupidity and the services. The movement here does emphasise gender equality as well as ethnic equality as well because otherwise it would have been hypocritical. I came to England when I was 15 years old from Jamaica and the first place I came to was Finsbury Park. She's a really a short little mallard and uh, we, we call her Lucy. And I hear her, hear her in there say, shut up, Lucy, and she yeah, was saying, shut, shut up. I'll call her over and she comes straight to me. And I always used to go down to the little shops and do messages, used to go to the library every day. I had a scooter that I adored, so one shoe always wore out before the other shoes. These trees are emanating healing vibrations out to all the people, and that is one of the reasons why it's so great to be in the park. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And same as the uh, swans, he's doing a new pair of swans that came in last October. And uh, we're hoping to get some youngsters off of them. Well, now they've got the names. They've got names now. And uh, they're, they're responding to the names, which is Rosie and Jim. But I wasn't really interested in the ducks and the dog. I was interested in some way for me to go and have a run. And I went over to, came over here and I saw this little dirt, dirt track. That's what it was before. And I started running around because people was running around it before because, you know, when you run in a place where it's dirt track, they leave marks, doesn't it? I used to be in a motorcycle club, run by a church, um, called the 59 Club. I used to just pass through here at one time. I say from 1950 to oh, what 66, 
65, somewhere around there. And I just, just used to pass through here. Yeah. And from then on, then on so, uh, well, I left work, I made redundance, and I came near quite a lot then for the birds. There are loads of trees and ducks and people, dogs and things like that. Segundo preludio, en el cual escucharemos las dos primeras historias sobre submarinos y otros detalles presuntamente históricos. A kinder transport is well known, and they came over here to England. They were lucky to get over here. Most of the people who came over here didn't get were were not were, survived as children, but their parents did not survive. And uh, the, the, as my father was older already, they interned him to the to Australia. And on the way, they tracked all his belongings into the sea, and luckily, a German. Uh, U-boat, which was found out after the war, was following them, this Dameria, on the way, all the way, uh, outside, in, I think in Atl somewhere in the way, he, they, they saw him, and uh, they followed this boat, and they were going to torpedo it, and then they, uh, I think they did torpedo one torpedo they sent, which missed, and then they went to see the rubbish which they had chucked out, and they realized it was in German, they thought there were German on this boat, that there were German prisoners of war, so they allowed the boat, all the way, they formed all the way, all the U-boats, all the way to Australia, six weeks, not to tell anybody, to know that this boat is carrying German refugees or German prisoners of war. And it landed in, they landed in Australia. And then on the way back, when the boat left the area, when, when, when the boat left empty, where they, they dropped all the prisoners of war, all the Jewish, they thought they were uh, German prisoners of war, they dropped all the Jewish prisoners. Of, prisoners. And on the way back, they torpedoed the boat and it sunk. And this was found out because the, uh, the German uh, captain of the torpedo boat who sunk the Daneria uh, was interviewed after the war. I don't know how exactly it came together, but it's a well-known story. I mean, you can only put so many people, so many people, in an area before you swamp it. But as a young girl, I think maybe the answer would be for girls to go around and start rampaging through the streets and cause a lot of trouble. You see what I mean? Because then you'd get noticed. I, it seems silly, but it seems to be the only way you can get anything done. <laughs> We have, we have a, you know, a large community here uh, also in Haringey. Um, it's nothing that's been by choice, I think. It's, uh, they've been you know, uh, put here when they've arrived to the country. Um, it's, I think it's down to council housing. Um, it's, it's, it's not a choice, to be honest with you. You've got to know where to draw the line. It's, um, for argument's sake, you can put a certain amount of people into an area and that is fine, it works. You try to put another load in and you're back to the slum conditions of not enough, people living rough, people living in rooms that aren't suitable and you've gone backwards. And it's not their fault, it's the people who are pushing them in. I like Le Red Leicester, I like Edam, I like Cheddar. Really liberal with che well, that's the main cheeses I have, you know, so. Usually cheese and pickle or ham, ham and cheese, ham and cheese, anything, you know. I'm pretty 
liberal, you know, tuna fish, anything like that, you know. So, and a cup of coffee, that's it. Uh, well, I was originally from West London and my mum moved to North West London. Um, I tried to go to my local borough to get a council flat in North West London, but it was quite hard. So I came over to East London and it was really easy and took it from there, really. We had a massive house because I've got like five sisters and two brothers. So we were a big family when we came. And so um, we, have, we have a huge house. I'm the only British, no, 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 no. There's about three British people that are living in the hostel and everyone else is um, foreign. And because people have been packed into slums before the war, I mean, it's a bit like it is now for packing people into houses in London. Uh, about three years now. It's quite long. Yeah. It's not, it's not that nice living in a hostel. <laughs> So when they're in the workhouse, for instance, uh, it was still the policy that families were split up. Uh, the men had to go and fend for themselves and mothers and children were in the workhouse. And uh, it was called an institution. I share the bathroom and the toilet with everyone else, but they're quite clean. It's the cleaner that cleans the, the whole place every single day. That was very simple. They were homeless. My parents were homeless and they were moved into something called halfway housing from what had been a workhouse, Marlborough workhouse. And uh, when my mother got TB, I think my father was rehoused. My sister went into care. Halfway housing, I think we still share lavatories and bathrooms and kitchens. And so my mother said the big thing was to have her own front door key, open the door, and close it behind her, and that was our space, that, that was us. So it's quite hygienic. I've never seen any rats or anything like that, even <laughs> no cockroaches or anything like that, which I'm quite surprised because we've got like a garden outside and um, lots of bushes and stuff like that where you'd expect there to be rats and stuff, but it's been all right. <laughs> so far, so good and then they were brand new flats on the Woodbury Down estate and everybody thought they were wonderful. And yes, I remember sitting up with my daddy in the removal lorry in the front, moving into a new house. And we didn't have anything. We sat on orange boxes and ate off orange boxes because my third birthday I had strawberries and cream off an orange box. <laughs> my room, uh, it's quite tiny, but it's not too bad because I've got a kitchen in there. So I've got my fridge, my cooker, my bed, my wardrobe. So it's just, it's all I need really. So yeah, it's convenient. And yes, it was wonderful. They're going to pull them down now because they're substandard, but we thought they were marvellous. We moved to the Woodbury Down Estate, which is, um, well, that was after I came out of the forces, which was in my early 20s. So uh, I've lived around here for, since then. At that time, they were fairly strict. They used to come round at regular intervals to see whether you'd had babies or lost babies or they'd um, gone out to work and all that. So they, um, they were quite strict on it, that the, those um, rooms would remain occupied. And, and when I was a child, I remember there was a specific policy. Each block had 25 flats, pretty well, and there was one problem family per flat and the idea was that with 24 decent working class families or whatever then the one problem family could be absorbed. And I think they were more or less ready to evict anybody who had a spare bedroom, move, move them into a smaller flat. So it doesn't matter whether you're a young couple or an old couple, I mean obviously young couples were prepared to um, make their families larger. So if you had one, well, that just about um, gave you uh, the right to own a two-bedroom flat. We had park keepers then, had little brown uniforms, and uh, they told you what to do and kept you in order. Well, yes, the first uniform I had was brown, 
Then it went to blue. Now, now it's green. <coughs> and that's the, the last change I, I had was from blue to green. So that's it. It was quite hectic because um, we had loads of shrubs and they were quite high and thick. So that was a, a job to get them down. We had to bring them down to sort of like um, waist level because um, it was too dark and uh, it was quite hectic. So we had to cut a lot of stuff down. Folks, rakes, swing block, wooden rakes, pitchforks, mostly secateurs, loppers, saws. That's mostly gardening, the most little gardening tools use. Basically repairing playground equipment of all types and they're, if you like, uh, grown-ups Meccano. So everything unbolts, we're fished around here, there and everywhere because there's no real profit in playground equipment. Because I'm a Jewish beekeeper, um, I'm not sure what practices people would have as far as cleaning the extractor is concerned. So if they clean the extractor in a sink or, in, or if, if the extractor would come into contact with uh, non kosher utensils, that would, that would potentially cause a problem if you're washing them together. So, better to be safe than sorry. And uh, I, would, I do supply my honey to, 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 to the local community. Um, so I, I, I actually did invest in my own extractor. Because it's all repair to damage. And uh, that's about it, basically, you know, there's no profit margin to play equipment, it's always an outlay on the council. person from education come into the schools when, when I was there and uh, everybody, you know, oh, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this? Do you want to be a fireman? Do you want to, you know? And uh, actually I said I wanted to be in the Forestry Commission to grow trees, more often than not, knock them down. <coughs> But unfortunately, I was too young for that because I had to go further up the country to either Gloucestershire or that way. So they said, oh, we'll get you into the local council, see if they got something to do with the parks department. So that was it. I went for the interview and, uh, to the park superintendent and uh, I got the job. Come in, come in after Easter, April the 6th, 1959. I started on the Monday and that was it. It was the last big smog in London and I was going to a school in Camden Town at that point and the fog was so bad that traffic stopped dead. So instead of staying on the bus, I walked home. And when I got to Finsbury Park, I had difficulty crossing a road and all I could see was this huge flame in the sky. Could, couldn't work out what it was. So I made my way towards it and it was a policeman, literally only halfway across the road. I couldn't see the policeman, I could see the flame. And he was holding a flaring torch. Reprise. A discussion off stage on the relative merits of the alternative or alternate pronunciations of leisure and leisure. <laughs> Lower back, shoulders, chest, and then the head. Um, last July, I uh, fractionally dislocated my thumb. Um, when I played youth, I broke my left ankle. Um, we've got a spiral fracture, which is a fracture right around the bone in this hand right here. Um, separated this shoulder. Um, I've got elbow bursitis, basically you hit that elbow when it swells out to about there. So I've had that a couple of times. Um, and just X amount of, you know, scars and cuts and scrapes. So I don't even really need any tattoos or anything like that because I'm covered in scars as it is, you know. So, yeah. It's, I, mean, but I, mean, I mean, some guys, they get hurt. You know, they're like, you know what, this is not for me. 
I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm not ready for this. I mean, I, I broke a whole load of bones, but I love this sport so much that I'm like, you know what, I'll just get fit and come back because I couldn't really imagine not playing this game or being involved in that somehow. It's just a, just a straight up love for the game, you know, you get hurt, but you, you know that's going to happen. It's a collision sport, it's a violent sport, it's an angry sport, and you know that when you get in there. So, you know, it's like going to the army, you know, you know certain things are possibly going to happen, but you, your love for what you want to do is just going to keep you doing it until basically your body packs in and says, you know what, I can't have no more. And until that happens, I'm going to be involved in the sport. People are a lot more. The people aren't as harshly judging in in North London as they are in Southern Hertfordshire. You know, you can you can be different and be accepted. Uh, say, for instance, walking about with a pet python in Finsbury Park, some people might sort of take a step back, but certainly you won't have people running a mile or think that you're slightly strange or liable to eat their children or something of a night time. <laughs> so it's, it, it's it's because it's a more accepting area. I certainly feel more comfortable in Finsbury Park than I did in. Than I did in Hertfordshire. Always be someone in the playground supervising everybody. So, of course, you know how swings go higher and better when you stand. They, she would always come bustling over and say, Get down, sit down, you know, sit on the chair. It's too dangerous to stand up. So. It's like an adventure, which is how kids should see the play equipment. It's not a swing or a slide, it's an adventure. And the more safe you make the equipment, the less of an adventure it is. I mean, the worst thing, the awful thing, was the dreaded fiasco of the Walter Park. They had the most amazing adventure playground, huge stones, and it was all water. And you had water everywhere, just absolutely stunning. And we waited months and months and months for this thing to open. And about two weeks after it opened, we went pelting down there to enjoy it to discover that it had been closed. I'd heard it was political, that some, some parts of the various councils wanted it and some didn't. And of course, you can always use an excuse of health and safety. I suppose it probably was risky. It was an adventure playground. What do you expect? Uh, it was us that condemned it. Um, well, when it was finished, we went down there to look at it. Um, myself and my colleague got on it, and as we walked along, it started leaning because it was set in met posts. And if you got more than half a dozen kids on it, it would have gone over. So we said, you can't open it. And then apparently there was a to and a fro between them and the company, and all of a sudden it was taken out. So obviously it was dangerous, otherwise it wouldn't have been taken out. The fact is they closed it off, they filled it all full of concrete and it's just sort of been there ever since. He does. It's usually about two weeks after his feed. What happens is, is the outer layer of skin is too small for him because he's actually growing after each feed. So he needs, to, he needs to peel it off, but that's everything, including over his nasal passages and over his eyes, even his eyelids come off as well. So they can get quite irritable. Um, they certainly they don't get aggressive, but they just get irritable. They don't like being handled very often when they're shedding. They go a very gray color as well. It's, uh, it, it, they look kind of ghostly when they, when they start to shed, but he's, he shed quite recently. He's, got, he's still got some remnants left. Um, I hope this doesn't sound too in your face or whatever, but are you a hippie? What does it mean? Like, um, you know, peace and love? Not really if someone uh, will piss me off, you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> I can't be bad boy. Um, yeah, in, in my early days, yeah. Chelsea, uh, back then there were hippies and uh, mods and rockers and the teddy boys were like, you know, coming over. And, yeah, sure, 60s. Hey, man, peace and love. <laughs> peace and love. But they used to set their dogs on us. They used to set their dogs on me and my sister, and we'd have to run.
אישה או פנאי, כריתת עצים וצריכים בפארק ושימושים עדכניים ללבנים. I've spoken to a few people who only know the area out of rumour and they said that they wouldn't go anywhere near it, you know, they'd heard bad things about it. But growing up there, I'd, I'd seen a few bits and pieces, but then I'd seen the same thing when I'd moved to Hertfordshire as well. I think that every, every community that you go in, there's going to be bad people, bad things. But, it, you know, I, I wouldn't have stayed there if I didn't want to. I certainly wouldn't have come back if I didn't, if I didn't think the place was safe enough for me. One day I was walking out of my door and I saw a guy, like, injecting his leg right outside the... The hostel. <laughs> I was like, "What are you doing?" He was like, and "I was like, oh, are you, are you okay there, mate?" He was like, "Yeah, I'm all right, babe. <laughs> are you all right?" I was like, "Yeah, but you know, there's kids that play around here, and they just leave their their injections and stuff on the floor and in the phone boxes and stuff." So that it's open, it's it feels safer. However, it's also very exposed. They've taken out a lot of the the really nice shrubbery that used to be in this area. So that's why if you, if you go around to the park now, it looks a lot, a lot better. Because you can see right through and, you still, um, and it's, a lot, it's a lot safer. I mean, obviously I heard that there was cottaging and whatever went on there. Um, and that was the reason people were scared to go there. Like you might be scared to go to the heath at night, um, especially if you thought you might be mistaken for one of the people indulging in these practices, whatever. The area, Finsbury Park, 1967, somewhat racist, um, you're talking about skinheads um, and some, some nasty things. So a lot of, I suppose, black guys of my generation who grew up in this area, um, a big percentage I would have thought, got caught up in that. Um, fights and all sorts of nasty things, you know. Um. But to be honest with you, I think a lot of the residents now are, are taking a bit of more of a stand on that, uh, kicking out people from the stairwells and so on. I mean, me and my brother might do it every now and again when we go and visit my father who still lives there. Uh, you know, we'll still, you know, there'll be people on the steps doing business they shouldn't be doing and we'll, we'll quite happily ask them to move on and if not, we'll, we'll find a way of getting them moved on. Uh, and I, I think a lot of tenants now are, are taking that stance because they've decided that why should they have the grubby, horrible reputation of having the worst place in in Islington, or certainly the area of Frimsbury Park. And I think the brothers got upset, you know. I think the brothers got upset. Sparked riots all over the country. All over the country. Yes. Easy now. Shh. From Notting Hill, 1976. Right up to Broadwater Farm. What was that, 85? I think, can't remember. Yeah, that was a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> just recently they found out that the leader of the Kurdish people, because he's been imprisoned since 99, and um, he's in a one-man prison in Lebanon Island, and the lawyers managed to get a sample of DNA, which revealed that he's getting poisoned slowly, slowly. So um, European-wide, they started doing these hunger strikes. The one here was particularly to support the one in Strasbourg. Hey! It was a 10-day hunger strike. Um, the day after I left, uh, it went quite well, but, you know, it's quite a lovely environment because they sort of sing and talk until late hours and what we done was we camped outside. Um, we had Finsbury was just behind us, it was just outside the Manor House station. On the last day, um, a petrol bomb was thrown into the tent. Sur des matières sérieuses et émouvantes, le parti des cocktails Molotov La route de l'arc-en-ciel et une message courte des Ovaltines. A Muslim lady come in with her prayer mat and she said, I've got prayer mats. And um, the 
she said she was going to say her prayers and explain what she was doing. And she said, what I'd like you to do while I'm saying my prayers is say a prayer to your God. It had already kicked off. Basically, we, we, the street was dimly lit and you see guys left and right um, in that area at that time. You don't really think too much of it. Um, so we walked into it not knowing what was going on until we saw the police. But it wasn't a, far, a great deal of police. It was a few here and a few there, but they were getting ready with support behind them. As I said, they had blocked off uh, a road to the left of us to charge down the street. Um, and we were trapped between, you know, the two sets of people, if you like. So when they charged down the street and the guys were throwing bottles of Molokov, Mol 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 you know. Um, there was some damage done to the tent, I think, but no one, um, no one was hurt because um, it hadn't quite reached. What happened was um, <clears throat> some, they managed to chase after the person and um, they lost four people, but they found one person hiding under the car. They asked who he was and he said he wasn't Turkish. The police later on revealed he was Turkish and they found much more petrol bombs around the park that they hadn't managed to use. It was the time where England needed a lot of people to come over and do labour jobs. So my granddad came over. Then he eventually brought over the whole family. Yeah, it's quite, we've, there's quite a big community where my nan is because they all came over to sort of do these labour jobs and that's how it all started, really. I think that's the same with um, Black Stop Road with a lot of the Algerians. I, thought, I think a lot of them uh, came over in the 80s, I think, and they came over here to work and then they eventually brought over their families and stuff like that. But I think it's a lot harder for immigrants now to move over abroad. I remember when the uh, blacks came over here at the beginning, when the coloured came from Jamaica and all that, and the bus drivers in 1953 and all them, when they came over here, this area, they came over here, lots of, uh, they came to this area, a lot of them. And uh, they weren't treated very nicely. In the beginning, I still remember when uh, uh, blacks, if you employed a black person, the other English people, the Irish or other English people wouldn't, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow, they wouldn't work together with them. I remember they, it was a hard, long, hard struggle on the buses to, get, to allow the blacks in to come into the, uh, to working on the buses. There were lots of people who didn't want to work with them together. They classed them lower. England was a very different place back then. Um, and we had things like shit, excuse my language, put through the letterbox and niggers go home and blacks go back and stuff that you guys probably have heard but wouldn't really understand. It's decades ago. So, um, nonetheless, they still, you know, closed. They turned a hunger strike with songs and music and dance. But, um, you know, the attack was still done. And it, it sort of, you know, showed that the conflict is still here, even though we're in London. And, um, we all still struggle by peaceful means. A lot of ignorance, um, lack of understanding, and probably lack of wanting to understand. The generation today is a lot more open, I dare say a lot more freer, which I don't agree with all of it, but more understanding. Um, I was thinking lately that probably the only successful uh, example of communism is, is the beehive, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that I think that the, the human beings who, who are kind and considerate are probably more moralistic than any other creature on earth. So theoretically, if people have become as self-centered and greedy as I fear they may have done, then as soon as we have some sort of downturn, and we're fairly likely to. Finsbury Park will be very low down the list of priorities and it'll revert. Uh, on the other hand, maybe everyone will come to some age of Aquarius and say, this is terrible, we've all got to be more spiritual, we don't want to spend so much money on things, we want to have a better lifestyle, neighbourhood, so on and so forth. Yes, maybe it will become even better because there's still room for improvement, there's always room for improvement. 
I have no understanding of God whatsoever. What God is and how to understand it. No understanding whatsoever. You could understand that. People my age, you didn't have social workers in there. The church, whatever your church was, be it synagogue or, or Church of England or Methodist or Roman Catholic, the church was your social worker. When you were ill, they were the people who came and looked after you. Natural existence, I think, you know, people from all over the world, all societies, all communities. Um, I don't think I've met an Eskimo here yet, but, you know, I've met everyone else. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons. Um, I like to speak different languages. Um, most of the Kurdish community, unfortunately, cannot speak Kurdish because it was banned for so long. But um, I came to this country when I was three, and so I had, um, you know, the, the chance to speak Kurdish freely at home. So I know Kurdish pretty well, fortunately, but a lot of the com uh, Kurdish community do, do not know Kurdish and they have to speak Turkish. And a lot of them also um, introduce themselves as Turkish as well because of this, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. My nan's been here for 35 years, but she knows hardly any English. <laughs> she hardly, she can only say like the basic words. She hasn't learned anything. And that's because the community, everyone's from Morocco and they've all stuck together and went to each other's houses and gone shopping together. And so she's never had that need to talk much English. And Language is very important and language is important for any nation. It's, it's a very important part of their identity and it's a way of um, preserving their culture, preserving their heritage and expressing their own <laughs> identity as well. So it's really important for any nation. Uh, I will vote for anybody who gets us out. I don't care if it's the Monster Raving Looney Party, the Oval Teenies, I don't care. If they get us out of Europe, they've got my vote. As well as um, problems associated with ethnicity. Um, there's also the uh, patriarchal situation in Turkey. And um, the, the political ideologies that we support um, put a lot of emphasis on the equality of women and men. For a nation to be free, it needs to be free in every aspect, not just political sense, but um, you know, gen gender differences should be um, established as well, and these needs to be recognized and the democratic you know, process is is dimensional process. It can't be done in, in one way. I am a feminist, and um, like most Kurdish families, they they are patriarchal and they do oppress the women a lot. And um, I I was prob I was the first person in my family who who managed to break away and were you know moved out of London, which would be unacceptable. I think that what what happens is. You join a central spiritual, there is a spiritual up there and which you, your father was part of and you were part of and suddenly you join, and your grandfather and everything, and you join this spiritual uh, unity of whatever it was, you join. You came off a bit and you join, that's the way I can look at it. But you can't see people as a human being because the body is dissolved completely gone. So I can't believe that you see a person and you come back to believing in God as a thing. I believe that you join a sort of spiritual understanding. I don't know exactly, but it's my fantasy that you join a spiritual understanding. Religion was, it wasn't my life and my religion. It was just one thing. And, and that's, that's a pity. It's not more like that now. No, I'm an atheist. I'm, I'm pretty revolutionary in every aspect. No, I, I'm not religious. Um, I was like, my mom is very religious. She sort of prays five times a day, doesn't have a clue about Islam. It's more about the cultural thing that she's grown up to. It's like, you know, never having to read the Bible, but, you know, going to church on Sunday, for example. It's, she's like that. Um, my dad was never religious. My, my father's parents were Polish Jews. Uh, my, father's, my father's grandparents came here, I think it was in the 1930s. Uh, just they came here for, uh, on business and, and they, they managed to, to settle down here and um, establish a, a, a wine business in the east end of London. Um, then my grandfather and grandmother actually came here in 1938 or 39 when, despite the fact that they weren't married yet together, but they were engaged to be married. And 
although it was quite unusual for a, a, a boy and girl to travel together, um, because of the because of the problems there was in in in, in Europe, where 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 the Jews were started to be uh, to be persecuted and people weren't sure what their future would be, they were advised by the rabbis of the time that it would be permitted for them, despite of our sort of segregationary um, practices for them to travel together as a couple because that would probably have been the only way she she got she got married eventually but um okay <laughs> it's a bit difficult to explain but she she got married in Tur to someone in turkey and then um, when she came here he went to the army and she changed her mind so she got a formality marriage done but then she changed her mind and the people there are even more radical, and they said, this can't happen. So then she had to elope with the person here, and what happened was they said, you either shoot down both of those people, your sister and the, hus the new husband, or you send over an upper daughter, <laughs> which was me at the time, because <laughs> that's the deals they make. Um, fortunately, I managed to get through to the social services and stop the whole visa thing, and I sort of also left a gap here. But um, at the end of the day, she had to elope. She, she had no choice. Either she would be sent there and punished or married in that sense, or she had to start her life again here. So, um, I mean, there are various explanations for that. I mean, a lot of girls here, because they're sexually oppressed so much here, they're not allowed to have boyfriends for so long. When they do go on holiday, they fall in love with the first guy they see, and suddenly they, they see it as an escape route, and they don't realise that they've actually gone into something that's much, much more worse. Um, my sister realises a bit early, well, too late or early, it's debatable, but as I said, um, there are very different mentalities that still exist, you know, in the 21st century. My mother has always thought it was a nice idea to be uh, say prayers when you have something physical to help, when things were difficult. If, when there's nothing to worry about, prayers are quite easy to say. When things are difficult, you need something to to get you to, to do something. And so she used the rosary. I don't know, it's just nice to change lifestyles sometimes. It's not good to be in all your life, so, yeah. Officiel kent under navnet blå kapitel et sted for smukhed og meningsløs. Det, der ikke kan sættes i bås, diverse og ellers andet sted. Don't give away any mommy secrets, honey. Mm. She's a bird. She's a fish. Where will they live? Yeah? Chris Nu. Altus in Yaren the Dollar. On Doris Scale, Fui Tomu. Talking clear when our Shanachus came out of Tashi. Altus Pigamweed got Hepper in that Owlin. Tinuint Comparado on Vacura, Cockerock, Altus Tuohoil. If when they say everything goes into slow motion, believe you me, that's true. I saw the ceiling, it was lit up, and I saw our ceiling coming down very, very slowly on top of us. Finsbury Park, funnily enough, and Blackstock Road, there are a lot of people who sort of say, oh, it's very run down, oh, it's poor people, oh, they're all loutish, whatever. 
Uh, Finsbury Park was always like that. Finsbury Park always had a bad reputation. It's just then it was white working class and now it's not. <laughs> it's, uh, and as for Stroud Green, again, it's not an area I knew when I was young. But I can see, even since I've moved back to North London, that Stroud Green is becoming slightly gentrified compared to. So Finsbury Park has not changed. I mean, Clissold Park is the funny one, because Clis all of that area was poor, very poor, when I was young. It was slums around Stoke Newington. But you go to Clissold Park now, and it's all yummy mummies with their fantastic buggies and their children in their designer clothes and their fancy stuff and so on. So that's completely changed. But it seems to me that Finsbury Park still serves a purpose for people who haven't got gardens and money and resources and lots of toys and this, that and the other. We had nothing left. My bike was behind our front door and it was a mangled mess of metal. The front door was glass, hadn't got a crack in it. And up on the first floor where our living room was, there was the mantel shelf with all the letters tucked behind the clock, my mother's rosary hanging there and so on. And my, the record that I, I put in the box was found in the garden of the house opposite. And that was the only thing we got out of the house. We didn't get anything else out. And my brother came out absolutely, um, absolutely untouched, like we all did, my middle brother. We went in the Navy and uh, into submarines and, oh, he, that was, he was 12 then. So it would be seven years later, a ship, Swedish ship collided with his submarine just outside Rochester and he was never found again. Nobody was of the actual crew, only the officers who were having a party on deck. And we've never, they never made an investigation, they never gave any information out. Even the Guardian tried to find out what exactly what happened. But it was what wasn't reported until they picked the officers up onto the ship that hit them and they didn't report for five hours what had happened. So nobody was there to pick the sailors up when they came up. They would just stay down for a certain time and then come up. Nobody there. So that was some... Um,
uh, if anybody's watching this film, then apply into the clubhouse for a, an application form. So um, we hope this will be successful in our respect and uh, hope that maybe people will come along and at least watch the game and see what they think of it and um, agree to taking part.